Rodgers. Touchdown, UCLA. With USC great and NFL stud, Frosty Rucker. The Trojans back in front. And LAFB founder, Ryan Zyrood. On the Believe Podcast Network and LAFBnetwork.com. This is your destination for Los Angeles football. What's going on, Los Angeles? Welcome into the LA football show on a beautiful Friday evening. It is December 17th. Christmas is rapidly approaching. Insane that we are just over a week away from Christmas Day. It's my favorite holiday of the year. But thanks for tuning in. We are live on AM, the Mightier 1090 via radio airwaves. Pumped you're tuning in on your drive, your commute. Or if you're on podcast platform, Apple, Spotify, wherever you listen to podcasts or on our YouTube page at LAFB Network. If you want to watch some video, you can find us right there. We are on the LAFB Network, the LA Football Network and the Believe Podcast Network every Monday, Wednesday and Friday at five. Pumped you guys are here. Going to have a great show for you as uh, we get into and unpack this Chargers game. Thursday night, thriller at SoFi. You know, brutal loss for the Chargers, but a great game, a great test. Um, I have a lot of more positive takes on this game, I'm sure, than many. We're going to get into that. Uh, The Rams, 25 players currently on the COVID list as uh, they host the Seattle Seahawks this weekend at SoFi in in a divisional game, a very important game in terms of the Rams continuing their hopes to climb the seedings in the playoff picture with only four games remaining. Uh, Some new uh, rules, if you will, have been passed, I believe just yesterday, by the NFL and the NFL PA. So we'll get into what that means for this Rams team and for this game. Because I'll say on the onset, the NFL is like, they're they're making these teams play. Which, hate it or love it, it is what it is. Teams knew that going into the year. It's not some new thing. Um, they had some, it's kind of like last year. I talked about a lot last year. Like everyone was always up in arms over these games. It was like, they, last year was so fluid. Like they had a plan before the season. It wasn't a perfect plan. They modified the plan as the season went this year because of having vaccines, because of knowing what this virus is, because of knowing what it's capable of more. So still not a perfect science, knowing what hospitals can do, knowing how it affects players that are very healthy and whatnot. They had a more structured plan, and so teams knew about it. So I know there's, especially with teams fighting for playoff berth, and now all of a sudden if they're missing a lot of key starters, there's players upset that that could hurt their playoff berth. But, you know, it it was known. But all of that being said, it did just break today per Adam Schefter, Jordan Rodriguez, and others that this game is getting moved to Tuesday. So the Rams will have two more days to get a lot of these players off the COVID list. Uh, but we'll look into what that all means and and what the new protocols are that can potentially get these guys back in time. But they do have an extra two days. Game is set for 4 p.m. Pacific time on Tuesday as of now. So we'll get to that at the bottom of the hour. And to cap off the show, huge transfer for the UCLA Bruins. Chip Kelly continues to roll the dice on the transfer portal and continues to win. So we'll get all into that. The L.A. football show brought to you by our friends at Tick Pick. It's a new ticketing agency that has zero fees at checkout. The price you see is the price you pay when you use my link, TickPick, that's T-I-C-K-P-I-C-K.com slash L-A-F-B. It's that simple. If you're going to the Rams game this Sunday, still need your tickets, head to TickPick.com slash L-A-F-B and pick up a pair of Rams versus Seahawks tickets. You'll pay zero fees at checkout what better deal is there than that StubHub and Kickmaster gouge you extra money keep that money for yourself buy a $13 beer at SoFi much better much better money well spent so all right Chargers drop a tough one to division rival Chiefs it was a game that decided the leader of the AFC West they fall 34-28 in overtime and you know there's a lot of talk ensuing late in the hours last night into the early wee hours of Friday morning and probably will go on throughout this entire weekend about Coach Staley, 
and the fourth down calls, going for it five times on fourth down, converting, I believe, uh, just two of those, three of them being fourth and goal situations. Now there's, I would say, for the most part, most people are, at this point, saying that's what cost the Chargers the game. You leave potentially nine points. Like, you could have just kicked those field goals. Most of them were gimmies. Um, That's nine points on the board. They lose by six in overtime. You win the game. It's such a reactionary take, though. And I'm going to give you a few reasons why. And then we'll get into the actual game a little more. Each game... You have a game plan. You have a script to start off with. And then from there, the game evolves over 60 minutes, over 70 to 80 plays or so. It changes. The good coaches, the great players, are the ones that adjust the best when the game gets off script. So we can sit here and say, kick those field goals, nine points, Chargers win the game. But when those points go on the board, it also now causes Kansas City to change their game plan and evolve. And they're going to call the game differently. They're going to be more aggressive. Now, you know, this is all hindsight, just like it's hindsight saying they should have kicked the field goals. But you can't sit back reactionary and assume the game would have played out exactly the way it did just with the Chargers being nine-point victors. Because they take that seven... The only one I'll just say this, the only one I disagree, I think before the half, you just take that field goal. There's three seconds left. Um, you know, it's fourth and goal. Going to the half with points. You know, I think that there's that mindset of, okay, let's go up seven, or let's go up, uh, it'd be 21 to 10 if they converted it. it would be up 11 points, which is a huge, you know, first half swing. Whereas 17 to 10 is just one touchdown game. And so I get the analytics of it. I get all that. But I think, the repercussions of failing that and sending all the momentum to Kansas City going to the half, I think, was more than I would have liked. I, I don't hate it still. It's all about execution um, at this point. I mean, those are those are playing the Chargers' favor with the offense they have, with the quarterback they have. But that was the one where I've been like, yeah, I would have just taken the points. But, so as I was saying, I mean, the game changes completely once you put those points on the board. Because let's say they go, at, they take that field goal, 17 nothing, and then the chart, Chiefs come out in the second half, and they're calling a very different game after that. Um, they may end up going for it more often. So a lot of things can swing and change. So I don't like this reactionary, well, yeah, you, you take those nine points, it's, it's a win. Because it, 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 there's so much that changes. One play changes the next play. Um, just like in life, right? Like one little thing, it's like the butterfly effect, as they say. One thing has the ripple effect down the line of the next thing. Um, so you can't just sit there and say, okay, take the points and you win the game. I'm for it. This has been Brandon Staley's MO since he's been a head coach in this league for this Los Angeles Chargers team. And it's what he sticks to. Said in his press conference after the game, because of course he was asked about it. It's like, this is what we're doing here. This is who we are. You can almost see it in a, not angered at the reporter for asking it, but like said it with conviction. Like, get used to that here in Los Angeles because this is how we are calling games. We're not settling. We're not participating. As he said in one of his, uh, against the Chiefs in earlier in the season when they won, we're not here to participate. We're here to compete. And we're here to win. And you beat teams like the Chiefs by getting touchdowns, not settling for field goals. All year last year, and during the Anthony Lynn tenure in general, it's a team that settled for punts or field goals, and a team that continually lost by one score. They led the league in one score losses. Most of those by less than three. Field goal or less of losses. So you can't sit here and say you're going to win these games by settling for these field goals. Because we've seen it over the course of the last four seasons. Where that didn't happen. And I know it's easy to say that when the game ends in a loss. As it did last night. But it ended in a win the first time they played the Chiefs. Those fourth down conversions, not settling, being aggressive, putting your foot on the throat of the, the best team in the AFC. Best team in the NFL, you could argue. 
So you can't be happy about it when it works and condemn it when it doesn't. Live by the sword, die by the sword, right? As the old adage goes. And I love it. You're going to have some of these tough losses. But you're going to have some of these great wins. And this is a team that coming into the season was projected by most as a nine-win team around that area. Some as low as seven, some as high as nine or ten. They're sitting at eight and six still with three games to go. Got the Texans next week. The team could still win 11 games. Ten would be, I think, if people before the season said, hey, this team's going to go ten and seven, have a shot for the playoffs, you'd be ecstatic. You can't sit back now and see what they've been doing and you lose a tough one to a division foe and all of a sudden think, oh, man, bad coaching. I saw someone um, tweet out. I, I'm drawing a blank on who it was. There's someone, a high-profile media member now, former GM, tweeted something basically to the tune of, uh, whoever, if you have your, your Brandon Staley for Coach of the Year card, go ahead and rip that up now. I strongly disagree. But that's okay. That's okay. Unfortunately, the world we live in now is so reactionary. And it's not just fans. It's the hot take media. You know, your first take, your your morning shows. That that's what they're based around is these, you know, playing Monday morning quarterback and hot takes. And, you know, podcasts, we do it too. I'm not sing, I'm not excluding myself from that. But I like to sit back and look at the big picture. And let's not be reactionary and say, because of misconversions on fourth down, all of a sudden this isn't a coach of the year candidate. Right? Like the first fourth down. Well, let's break them down. First one. Great pass from Herbert. Great play called Donald Parham in the back of the end zone. Dude catches it, comes to the ground. Praying for him. I had like a seizure. Horrible. Have just heard while recording this that he is in the hospital. He is stable. He is reactive. Suffered a concussion. But okay, so you can't blame that on on the call. Like the dude caught it. It's a great play. Comes down as he comes down, lights go out. Drops the ball. There, I'm not putting. There's no blame on anyone there. It's a fluke incident, and you pray for the player's health more than you convict the fourth down call. So that's unfortunate. You know. Then you get you know the the stop at, at the half. You get the attempt uh, around the 30-yard line where they're going. Uh, it would have been a deep field goal, no guarantee, like a 47-yarder, 50-yarder. Aren't able to convert that. And then they get another one at the goal line. A great, like, speed zone, and Matt Filer just absolutely obliterates the Chiefs defender. Convert that one. You know, you get the Josh Kelly fumble, which was actually on third down, not fourth down. Just unfortunate. Eugenio Wosa then makes one of the greatest interceptions I've seen a linebacker make, and then they punch it in the next. So that one kind of, we can wash that away. But anyway, I have zero problems with the fourth down calls. And, and Staley, if you've listened to his press conference, you'll notice if you haven't, you should listen to it. But he says explicitly, when I'm going for it on fourth down, I'm not gambling. I'm going for it because I believe we have the advantage in that situation. If I was gambling, I would not do it. I don't care what the analytics say. If I think it's a gamble, it's a 50-50 shot, we're either going to punt or set it for the field goal. But if I believe we have the advantage, meaning I have trust in my guys, I believe we have the defense on their heels, I believe in the play calling that we have in this situation, I'm going for it. And why would you not want a coach to do that? (laughs) Why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? Because more often than not, the season it's worked. And we're getting because last night we're getting closer to that fifty percent of uh, converts and not converts. But overall, more often than not, it's worked. The thing, biggest thing I take away from this game, though, aside from that, is the Chargers' resolve. I think they showed great resolve in this game. You know, you have opening kickoff with a great return, great return. Turf Monster got him, unfortunately. Andre Roberts, who's been a, a great addition 
who has, you know, flipped the script on the special teams unit just with his return ability. Drives all the way down there. First play, Austin Eckler gets a nice, like, 12-yard run. They get down uh, to the goal line, and that's that first fourth down fail with Donald Parham dropping in the end zone, you know, getting injured, getting stretched off. So then not only do you have the emotion of going up big, or not going up big, but big return, the emotion of a nice run to set it up right away, the emotion of potential touchdown looks like a catch, drop the the deflation of, oh, man, we just failed fourth down, to, wow, my teammate and friend is on a stretcher, like looking like he's having a seizure on the stretcher, knocked out, unconscious. So you have all that emotion. When you get back on the field, Chiefs drive all the way down, touchdown, 7 nothing. Chargers get the ball back, linebacker deflects it, interception, Chiefs go down, defense holds to a field goal, but you're down 10 nothing. It's like, okay, here we go. The route begins. The route begins. No. Next possession, Chargers go down, score a touchdown. Chargers defense holds. Chargers go down again, score a touchdown. Now they're up 14-10. That, to me, alone, takeaway from this game, is the resolve of this team, the coaching of this team, the talent of this team that is so different from years past. So if you're a Chargers fan, a longtime Chargers fan, you should have been thinking that by the middle of the second quarter, and you should have been thinking that already a lot this season. This team is different. This team is special because of what they were able to do in that adverse situation, come back from that, and then battle, take the lead, and then battle all game. Defense played their ass off. Offensive line blocked their butts off. You lose Rishon Slater, not just the best rookie tackle, a top five tackle this year in the NFL. Top five tackle, left tackle. You don't have him in this game against a Chiefs team that's been very good rushing the quarterback. Well, guess what? Trey Pipkins stepped in, who's been a not a fan favorite, not a media favorite, comes in, gives up three pressures, zero sacks. Storm Norman on the right side, zero pressure, zero sacks. The offensive line is a whole zero sacks. Chargers rushing 192 yards on the ground. Blocked their butts off. Offensive line, shuffling players, had a phenomenal game. Phenomenal game. That's what you build on. Now all of a sudden, I know it's one game. Now all of a sudden you say, okay, Trey Pipkins, maybe he's not a lost cause. Maybe he is finally developing into the player that we hoped when they drafted him in the third round of Sioux Falls. That we were told, this is a three-year project. And after two years, everyone wants to throw him to the wind. It's one game. But if this game showed us anything, maybe he is progressing. Maybe we should listen to people that know more about coaching offensive line than we do one game we'll see how that continues to progress because they're going to get Slater back uh should have him back hopefully next week off the COVID list and then you look at the defense injuries they had on defense Derwin James played the first half and then didn't go the second half I mean that alone Travis Kelsey had one catch when Derwin James was in the game ends up finishing with like 177 yards once he goes out it's hard to blame injuries because it's the NFL. Everyone deals with them. But when your best defensive player is shutting down their best defensive player and then leaves and that now best offensive player goes off, there's a reason for that. And his backup is also out. So now you're on your third string safety taking over. The whole storyline is defense can't stop the run. I think that needs to be thrown out the door right now. We've seen the improvement over the last six weeks. 86 yards on the ground yesterday. Patrick Mahomes was the leader in the rushing, and that was on one play in overtime, unfortunately. <laughs> Unfortunate timing for it to happen. He was our leading rusher with three rushes for 32 yards. So let's just throw that out that the Chargers can't stop the run anymore because I think they've they've solved that issue, coaching. So... I know many will look at the stat sheet and say, man, Mahomes really took it to, to Justin Herbert. When you look at the stats, Mahomes 410 yards, Herbert 236. You know, if you watch the game, you know, Mahomes, you know, is still the best quarterback in the game. Anyone that watches him play knows his stats get inflated a lot by, you know, Yak. You know, he got 100, almost 150 yards on those off three Kelsey catches, three seven yard slant routes that 
Kelsey took for a lot of yards. So, and that's just the Chiefs offense. And that's not a discredit to Mahomes or saying he's not worthy of the praise, but you know, sometimes you need to watch the whole game and say, yeah, he played good, but it wasn't like a route him versus Herbert. So it's going to be a rivalry for a lot, a lot of years with these two teams. A lot of fun. I think they're going to play again in the playoffs. I think I, I was talking to people last night on Twitter, and this is a matchup we're going to see three times a year for a long time, which is exciting. So tough loss for the Chargers. They get a couple days off before they head, um, or they get back, obviously, next week. They're playing Thursday, you get a nice three-day break. They can get some rest, get some players healthy, hopefully, and then they uh, play the Texans next week, which should be a nice bounce-back game for them. But we'll get into that all next week. So quick break for me here. Once we get back at the bottom of the hour, got to talk about this Ram situation. Uh, with COVID against the Seahawks, and we'll get into that UCLA Bruins transfer. Stick with us. Welcome back to the LA Football Show right here on AM The Mightier 1090, always on the LA Football Network, live on LAFB Network YouTube. Thank you all for tuning in. Thanks to our friends over at Golden Road Brewery. If you haven't had Golden Road Brewery yet, what are you doing? If you enjoy beer, you got to get out, my friends, Golden Road Brewery. They have locations uh, in LA, Anaheim, Huntington Beach, and they are sold everywhere. You can get beer. Ralph's, Vaughn's, Total Wine, Bevmo, anywhere you go, Golden Road. They got the uh, Who's House, Blonde Ale, delightful. If you like, if you want a nice Rams cam, they're doing the the cart, the fruit cart series. Mango carts are phenomenal. I really like their uh, Golden State Cerveza. It's basically their American version of a, a Mexican lager. Fantastic. So Golden Road Brewery, make sure to check them out. Tell him, tell them that the guys at the LA football network sent you. All right. So, Oh man, Rams coming off a huge win over the Cardinals. Um, huge win statement. win. join this team is for real this team is absolutely for real, absolutely for real and an absolute playoff contender. And then one by one, you see all these players get added to the COVID list. 25 total. 25 total players currently on the COVID list for the Los Angeles Rams. The latest ones, you got, you know, your stars right now on there are Yvonne know, Miller's on there. Odell Beckham Jr.'s on there. Jalen Ramsey, I believe, is still on there. Who missed last week? Rob Havenstein's on there, your starting right tackle. Jordan Fuller, your starting safety, and the guy that wears the green dot on his helmet is on there. You've got a bevy of really solid starters on there. Oh, and then you have a lot of special teams guys on there as well, and depth pieces. So this is a crazy situation. Seahawks have some guys on there too. Tyler Lockett had been added recently. Um... The whole league is getting hit right now. The whole, the whole, the whole world is. I mean, we all knew, or you should have known, vaccination or not, this time of year, you know, we're gonna get some cases. We're gonna spike in cases a little bit. It's just, it's natural in general. Whether it's COVID, whether it's flu, whether it's anything, colds, whether it gets colder, it's the holidays. You're around more people, family, traveling. It's how sicknesses spread, unfortunately. And I'm not going to get into all that because that's not what this show's about. But we knew this was coming. I think everyone has been paying attention, anticipated there to be spikes in this stuff coming um, for the NFL and, and how they would adapt and how teams are going to adapt and how coaching is going to adapt and and what you do when you're in your practices. Like, are you separating guys to be safe so they're not contact? Uh, you know, I think the entire league now is an intensive protocol. The Rams have been in that since the Cardinals game, so they've been all virtual um, or doing stuff outdoor. But what I know there's a lot of people thinking, like, how are they going to play this game? 25 guys on the list. I mean, you don't even have enough players to, to fill the roster. But the NFL and the NFLPA just recently passed a new rule that if you're vaccinated, if you're vaccinated, you can come back as soon as 24 hours with one negative test and one rapid test. So still two tests, but it's a regular test and then the rapid tests that aren't aren't that accurate, if I'm being honest. So here we are sitting Friday night. 
this list uh, was as of the 25 players was as of Thursday. So we could see a lot of these guys. Oh, and it's asymptomatic based on your asymptomatic, which Sean McVay has come out and said to his knowledge, almost all of these guys are asymptomatic, which is a, first of all, that's just good. You know, we, we want players, people in general to be healthy. <laughs> that's more, that's more important than playing a football game. Let's make sure everyone's healthy, good bodies are right. Um, but the majority of all his guys are asymptomatic. So unfortunately they tested positive, but they're not like dying or ailing in sickness. You know, they're unfortunately just stuck at home waiting to get cleared. So if you're asymptomatic and you're vaccinated and you test negative, you can come back in 24 hours. So there's a good shot. Actually, I'm going to be the voice of positivity here for Rams fans listening. There's a good shot. Many, if not all of these players will be back by Sunday. Now, I, I wouldn't think that's likely that all of them will. I mean, there's still some people that are going to have this in their system and will not test negative. But I think a good majority will. Good majority will. And so all may not be as dire as, you know, the talk or, or you know, if you're on Twitter and, and thinking what players, you know, what's going on right now. I think uh, it's going to be better than what may seems i think they're gonna get more players back when you look just at the game itself i mean seahawks right now are playing very good football started off the season okay russ got hurt didn't win a game without russ russ came back a little rusty but now they're coming into their own and they're basically they're in they're in win out mode that's the only shot to make the playoffs is winning out so this is a absolute must win game for the seahawks so you know they're gonna throw everything in the kitchen sink at the rams Russ is back to form, playing well. All of a sudden, Rashad Penny, you know, first round draft pick from a few years back out of San Diego State, broke every like collegiate rushing record while at San Diego State, taking the first round. Who considered a great running back? I don't know if many considered him a first round running back. I mean, a lot of people just don't consider running backs first round draft picks, regardless, just because of the way the NFL is today, and with the talent at that position. But the Seahawks made him a first round pick. He's battled injuries. He could never really claim the starting role. Carson, uh, uh, I wanted to say Carson Wentz. Um, Chris Carson, their running back, has always kind of been that main guy, but he also battles injuries. You can't say all these. It's kind of like, when was one of them going to truly seize the role? And they just can't stay on the field together. Or even when the other one goes down, then they both go down. Or Rashad Penny finally is starting to kind of come into his own. Had a big week last weekend. He's a powerful bruising back with great speed can run between the tackles can be shifty has some breakaway inline speed as well so he's going to be a guy that you know this los angeles rams defense is going to have to hone in on going to have to hone in on and you know luckily thank god like regardless what happens with this covid list with the guys on it but you know aaron donald's not on it gray Gaines isn't on it so you still have your you know ernest jones you still have your interior guys that handle the pass rush or handle the, ru- you know, the rushing game as well are all good to go because that's going to be their number one task. Obviously getting Jalen Ramsey back will be huge because, you know, DK Metcalf, we know how much we love that matchup. One of my favorite matchups in the NFL. It's always just a blast to, to watch those two go at it. Um, if Tyler Lockett isn't able to go because he's on their list as well up in Seattle, then that matchup becomes very integral because that's who Seattle's going to have to go through. They're going to have to go through DK Metcalf with no Tyler Lockett. They're going to utilize their tight ends like they always do. But it's the bread and butter of that team based on the last few weeks is the running game and Rashad Petty, what he's been able to turn into so far, making his return to SoCal after playing at San Diego State. So it's an interesting game. It's a fun division game. A lot of storylines with how crazy this is going to be. Um, you know, if you're the Rams on offense, no Jamal Adams. Not that he's been great anyway, but no Jamal Adams. I love what the Rams have been doing with Sony Michelle in the running game, and you, you stick to that absolutely. I'm not saying not to, but this is a game where we could just hopefully see Cooper Cup yet again go off. But Odell Beckham Jr. is on the COVID list, so then you're down receiver also. Get Tyler Higby back. He came off it. Was said his said was said to be a false positive when he missed the Cardinals game. This is it's so much it's hard to preview this game really because it's like we don't really know who's going to play. 
the depth on the offensive line is is banged out. Trim and Ancrum's on the on the COVID list. So like we don't really know who's gonna play. So how do you really preview these matchups? But we do know as of now, Sonny Michelle, Matthew Stafford, Cooper Cup, all a go, and that's who your offense is going through is those three guys, which is how it's been the last three weeks, two weeks, and that's why the Rams have been successful. Pound the rock with Sonny Michelle, 20 plus carries. This guy should get 20 plus carries for the rest of the season. No matter what. No matter what, Sony Michelle should get 20 plus carries the rest of the season. And when Daryl Henderson is back and good to go, which he may be back in time for this game, ready to rock and roll, utilize him as that change of pace back. Not go back to him as the lead. I want Sony Michelle getting 20 plus carries, Daryl Henderson getting five to seven with a few other catches out of the backfield. That is what to me this backfield should be built around and will have success. And that was probably the plan all along with Cam Akers. He goes down, he traded for Sonny Michelle, takes some time for him to get acclimated to the offense. Because again, people that got to realize, you trade for a guy, he's not like learning four plays and like, okay, yeah, here's the football, go make stuff happen. Blocking assignments, you know, where to line up separately, snap counts, how, you know, Matthew Stafford calls in the huddle. A lot of stuff has to go into learning this playbook. I've said it before. I'll say it again. Many people have said this Sean McVay offense is a very complex one, as we all know. That's for the players, too. You don't just come in and learn it in 24 hours. It takes time to learn it. Players that were in this organization had, let's say, a rookie. You have from April till September with rookie minicamp, with training camp, to learn it. You can't expect a guy traded for an you know, before week one to come in and be ready to go week one. Same with Odell Beckham Jr. So now that he's really acclimated to it, it's like, okay, he's been the feature back. He's been successful as the feature back. Now let's keep him as the feature back and use Daryl Henderson in the role that was planned the whole time. That's why he was drafted to be that change of pace to Todd Gurley. Todd Gurley leaves the Rams take Cam Akers in the second round. For anyone out there is telling you, and I'm just going to be blunt about it, and this is no disrespect to Daryl Henderson whatsoever, but if there's anyone out there telling you Daryl Henderson can be a lead back in the NFL, they haven't watched Daryl Henderson his career. He is built to be that change of pace, high yard per carry average back. He averaged nine yards a carry at Memphis. Wasn't because he was getting 30 year carries a game. I can guarantee you that. He's an oper- he's a great running back, a huge talent, great speed, can burst games wide open. But you do that with the correct situation and by using another running back to kind of wear the defense down, and then you use a talent like Daryl Henderson to go and blow it open. Kind of reap the benefits of what the back before him sets up for him. And the reason why he's not capable of being a true 25-plus lead back is not because he doesn't necessarily have the talent. I think his his tackling ability or his breaking tackle ability isn't as good as what a lead back does. I mean, the guy just doesn't really break tackles very often. He's more shifty. He's strong. Don't get me wrong. You can't... Just because a guy doesn't break tackles, I mean, they're not strong, but he doesn't have that, that bruising... You know, Jerome Bettis, like, tackling a bit, the breaking tackle ability. So, Michelle has proven to have a much more capability of doing that. But the biggest thing is, unfortunately, he just can't stay fully healthy. Even this year. Hasn't had any crazy injuries, but it seems like when the dude gets three, four carries in a row, he then misses the next 10 minutes of the game. Misses the next three series with something lingering or something not right. I mean, it seems like every game we'll see that. He'll have a nice run. And I hear people say all the time, well, he just hasn't got the opportunity. Well, he hasn't got the opportunity because they're literally reporting that he's questionable return to the game (laughs) with with something banged up. And that's unfortunate, but I think that just shows that, hey, this dude's super talented. We love this dude on this team. He's great at, we know what he's good at. Let's use him for what he's good at and not force him to be force-fed the football. 
And there'll be people that are like, well, Sean McVay was so confident at the beginning of the year, so he's their guy. Well, it's like, what do you want your coach to say? Next man up. Like, you're not going to say, yeah, Daryl's good for five carries a game, so we got to go out there and find someone that can carry the rock. I'm like, yeah, come on. No quarterback. No coach is going to say that. You say, yeah. We drafted Daryl. We have full faith in him. We see what he can do at, at practice. Love his ability. But you know. You know needs you know you need someone else that is available for 20 plus carries. And he just hasn't been. So with that formula, and then we'll see him break stuff, which is that's the exciting thing. Use Sonny Michelle to break them down and throw Dale Henderson out there on a third and two and have him bust one for 25. That's what we want. That's what the Rams want. That's what Daryl Henderson wants. That's what Sonny Michelle wants. That's what Sean McVay wants. So that's the basis of what this offense should do moving forward. And then that's just going to continue to open things up like we saw against Arizona for Cooper Cup, for Odell Beckham when he's back, for Tyler Higby. And we can see Matthew Stafford continue to look like the great Matthew Stafford. Top 12 to 10 quarterback in this league. Don't care what anyone says. That's what he is. Ask the players. Usually players will be pretty honest about what they think about quarterbacks. And when all players are saying that he's a top elite quarterback, usually tells you something. I don't need some hot take guy on ESPN telling me something. I'll listen to the players and the coaches. And then I'll make my own assessments on what I see. Dude can play. And it helps when you have a capable running back in a running game, which he's never had. And now he's had finally a couple weeks of, of that working for him to his advantage and taking advantage. So we'll keep you updated the next few days on the LA football network on what's happening with this, you know, players on the COVID list, who will be back. But like I mentioned at the bottom of the hour, if you're just tuning in new rule for the NFL vaccinated players that are asymptomatic can come back within 24 hours. If they test negative and do a rapid test, to test negative as well. So still definitely a shot as of Friday right now that these players are back in time for Sunday's game but we'll keep you posted on that. Before we wrap up the show, this is the LA Football Show. I'm your host, Ryan Darrod. we got to talk about this big transfer to UCLA. This is big, guys. Any UCLA fans out there, or Trojans fans out there, because Trojans, with Lincoln Riley, the Trojans are going to out-recruit UCLA. I mean, without Lincoln Riley, they'd probably out-recruit UCLA. A, it's USC. B, Chip Kelly just doesn't really recruit. He's He, he recruits three-star, three- and four-star guys that fit his style, which, you know, credit to him. And he he plays the transfer portal. And he plays like a wizard. Because they just got Dylan Gabriel at a UCF. This is a special player. 2019, as a true freshman, threw for 3,600 yards, 29 touchdowns, and 7 picks. 2020, as a sophomore, 3,600 yards, 32 touchdowns, 4 picks. And last year was injured after 3 games. So coming in as a senior, wants to get back to that. I mean, he was he was a Heisman hopeful coming into last year and then got injured. And everyone kind of forgot about him. Heisman hopeful, potential high round draft pick. And the Bruins just landed this guy. Now we still don't know if DTR is officially declaring for the draft. Almost all UCLA players have said they're they're gonna take that on after the holiday bowl, which I respect. Uh they all want to play. You know, one guy has opted out on the defensive line. Ogbenia, uh, who's a great player. He'll be surely missed, uh, but pumped for his journey to the NFL. Everyone else that was playing in the game, they're deciding their fate after the game. So don't know for sure if DTR comes back. I would assume with this transfer, I would assume he would go to the NFL or maybe even transfer for his last year. I mean, it's hard. I think DTR had a phenomenal season. I think he's his teammates love him. His coaches love him. Great guy. Great guy in the locker room. Improved so mightily this season. I mean, he didn't have the the crazy yard statistics, but was able to do a lot more on the ground with his legs, and he cut the turnovers down substantially, which is why this Bruins team went 8-4. and four. But I, I, it'd be remiss if I sat here and didn't say I don't think Dylan Gabriel's an upgrade based on what we saw his first two years. And it'll be fun to watch him in Chip's, in Chip's system. 
So I don't know what's going to go. I mean, maybe DTR decides to come back and you just have that QB battle. I mean, I can't see bo- I can't see either one of them staying and being a backup. So either they believe if DTR comes back, believes I can beat him out. And then maybe Dylan Gabriel transfers again. I mean, you also have Ethan Garber sitting there who just transferred in last year from Washington. Who's a very capable, talented quarterback as well. Younger, has a lot more eligibility. So maybe he is, you know, you would hope he wouldn't transfer with this. You would hope he's willing to stay, have another year behind now Dylan Gabriel or if DTR returns, whatever does happen. And then take over, because I would assume after this year, Gabriel will play and then go to the draft the next year. And then Garbers can take over in his like junior season. A lot of unknown, but this is a phenomenal transfer for the Bruins. Um, He just adds a lot to the game. He's he's a great passer. He still does have some athletic mobility as well. Um, like, like Like you saw, seven picks his freshman year, four his sophomore year. You know how cute that is for this team? 11 interceptions over two seasons. That's huge. That's what can separate this team from an 8-4 and four team to a 9-3 and three or 10-2 and two team. He's played in some big games. I know it's UCF, but, you know, they had some great years until this year. I mean, they what, four years ago, five years ago, was that they claimed the, the number one team in the nation. <laughs> it was never official, but they took it as their undefeated season. So this is a great transfer for UCLA. It's a good time for Bruins as Chip Kelly returns. Uh, Holiday Bowl in just two weeks on the 28th. Uh, we'll be you know previewing that soon. I will be down there in San Diego for that game. So as I've mentioned, if anyone's down there and wants to hang out, would love to see you. Um, yeah, good transfer for the for the Bruins. Tough loss for the Chargers, but they will be okay. They will rebound. Eight and six now. You know, still a chance to go 11 and six, which is crazy. And the Rams, big game against Seattle. 25 players on the COVID list. We will keep you posted on what goes on with that. But that's going to do it for me. This is the LA Football Show. I'm your host, Ryan Dyrd. Make sure to subscribe wherever you listen to your podcast. Just type in LA Football or Believe in LA Football. We're on YouTube at LAFB Network. Website is lafbnetwork.com. We are your destination for Los Angeles football. Appreciate you all. Enjoy your weekend. Christmas is a week away. Week away. Next week, I will have my power rankings of my top 10 Christmas movies. So stay tuned for that. Looking forward to it. Should be a lot of fun as Christmas is my favorite time and Christmas movies are my favorite movies. So you do not want to miss Ryan Dyer's power rankings for Christmas movies. Enjoy the weekend, guys. Peace.